This week in the Enterprise Security News, Exagrid releases version 6.0 with the Time Lock ransomware recovery feature. Microsoft overhauls Patch Tuesday. Uh, Palantir begin trading on the New York Stock Exchange starting the end of this month. Uh, Accenture acquires Salt Solutions. And I added that really just so we could differentiate because there's a lot of there's a lot of saltiness in this industry. Uh, and Code 42, uh, a cloud native product, they're announcing that mitigates insider data exposures and exfiltration. In our second segment, Edward Wu, principal data scientist of ExtraHop, and Ted Driggs, the head of product at ExtraHop, will discuss demystifying AI and ML for cybersecurity. In our final segment, we welcome Jeff Capone, the CEO and co-founder of Secure Circle, for an interview on zero trust data security and what it really means. Stay tuned for all that and more on this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. Today, every business is a digital business. Most of us are migrating workloads to the cloud, adopting DevOps tools, rolling out RPA software, and supporting a remote workforce. While opportunity is great, so is the risk of advanced cyber attacks. Many high-profile breaches start with a compromise of privileged credentials. CyberArk is the number one leader in privileged access management. Talk to CyberArk today to secure privileged access for humans and machines across hybrid and cloud environments and on endpoints. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash CyberArk and stay one step ahead of the attackers. Cyber criminals are opportunistically targeting industries that continue to operate full tilt during the coronavirus shutdowns, and their attacks have grown more sophisticated. Given this shifting landscape, taking the appropriate countermeasures becomes paramount. Mimecast Email Security 3.0 helps you evolve from a perimeter-based security strategy to one that is comprehensive and pervasive with cyber resiliency in mind. From the company that stops at nothing to block cyber threats, Mimecast is offering a fully featured 90-day web security service. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Mimecast to learn more. Detecting and responding to threats in the cloud is harder than doing it on-prem. Even when you do have the visibility you need, legacy security workflows weren't designed for the speed and complexity of cloud environments. Cloud-native security solutions from ExtraHop are purpose-built to spot threats across the hybrid attack surface, provide detailed investigation steps, and help you automate response. Request your 30-day free trial at securityweekly.com forward slash ExtraHop. Welcome, everyone. It's episode 200 of Enterprise Security Weekly for September 23rd, 2020. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, joined by Mr. Matt Alderman. Matt, welcome. Happy Wednesday, Paul. That means about four and a half years or so. 220, I think, will be the five-year mark. So. Right. It's awesome. 200. This is the 200th episode. It's very nice. It's cool. Uh, love doing the show and uh, excited about today's show, actually. Uh, for a whole lot of reasons. Uh, quick announcement before we dig into it. Join the Security Weekly mailing list for webcast and virtual training announcements. Receive a personal invite to our Discord server. Uh, you can do all of that. Uh, you can subscribe to our mailing list, which will give you an invite to the Discord server. You can join our Discord server. You can subscribe to all of our shows by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe. It's official. Security Weekly, of course, in partnership with the Cyber Risk Alliance, is excited to present Security Weekly Unlocked on December 10th, 2020. The inaugural, inaugural, who put that word in there? In knowing inaugural. That I can't, inaugural, I did. thank you. <laughs> I wasn't prepared for that. Uh, <laughs> the inaugural edition of Security Weekly Unlocked, which will also celebrate our 15 year anniversary this year. Uh, which is also the 25th anniversary of the movie Hackers, which is interesting. Uh, registration will open soon, and a call for speakers is now open. You can visit securityweekly.com forward slash unlocked. Submit your speaking session. Uh, All righty, Matt, on to the news for this week. Yeah, lots of news in here this week. I mean, lots of news. Acquisitions, funding announcements, Microsoft IPOs. Ignite. Yeah. Yeah. Ignite. Uh, I, I added some Microsoft news in there. Um, it might be a good place to start because uh, it should go pretty quick. Um, the, I tried to pull out the security-related news uh, in here. Uh, some of it is going to take a longer time to decipher, um, but they did overhaul, overhaul their Patch Tuesday uh, security guide, 
um, which I didn't know they had a robust application for that. It's you visit this website and you can look at all the latest uh, Microsoft Patch Tuesdays. You can sort, filter, and you can export into Excel, which I thought was kind of funny because Microsoft is, does Excel. Um, and they've got a new vulnerabilities tab, which breaks down all of the CVEs and you can sort and filter. I was playing around with it earlier. Um, I thought they did a good job. Uh, some critiques on social media, but mostly praise. Uh, for the changes to uh, their update guide. So go check it out, especially if you haven't seen it before. Yeah, it's always been a challenge, Paul, for, mm-hmm. for vendors to get through the, the Patch Tuesday report, right? I mean, we've I've worked for two of the, the big three vulnerability management companies. Everybody's got to read this report, figure out what's in there, create the signatures, get them out. Uh, this just I, I think what this will do is make it easier for those research teams to turn around the appropriate uh, CVE checks than yep. it has been in the past. That's good. Absolutely. Um, they also announced, um, it, in this isn't so much enterprise news, right? Um, but the Edge browser, uh, the new Edge browser, which is really just Chrome, Chromium-based Edge browser, will be made available for Linux, which is kind of interesting. Um, so they are supporting... Uh, Windows 10, 7, 8, Mac OS, iOS, Android, and Linux with their new browser. So, I mean, they've really made a huge push to be in the browser market, um, which, I mean, they always have, but their browser has historically kind of sucked, actually. <laughs> yeah, well, remember the remember the fights back in the day when yeah. the uh, browser was part of the OS and all the court battles and all this stuff? And then, you know, that's, that's what I really think allowed uh, Google and... Uh, Chrome and some of the other browsers really take off when when that had to be separated out. You see definitely a resurgence of Microsoft wanting to be in the browser space. And I think a lot of this has to do with where they're going, Paul. I mean, if you look at what they've done with Linux, open source, the cloud stuff, they also want to be at the browser level because the browser is the interface into a lot of these services in Azure. So it makes sense. They also um, really, I mean, kind of embracing more of the Linux type of uh, community. Windows uh, Terminal Preview 1.4 includes a lot of really cool stuff uh, inside the Windows uh, Terminal, uh, which is more of a UI uh, improvement, but some cool features in there as well. Uh, I just got a a new Surface Pro 3 um, because I need to spend a little more time with Windows. I mean, it was all Linux on the rest of my devices. So we have to cover Windows and understand what's going on. Uh, and so I, I can't wait to, to play around with that. And the Windows subsystem for Linux, of course, um, got an update, uh, full Linux GUI uh, support, uh, GUI app support in there. They're supporting uh, X11 and Wayland. Um, and there was a talk about that uh, in, at the conference. So that's really cool. Uh, and Windows Package Manager Preview. Uh, a new command line package manager. And my only thought on that was hackers are going to abuse that. Like that is just ripe for <laughs> abuse. But yeah. yeah. And then they, uh, the, the third article is on improvements to Defender. Now, this is a very interesting announcement because we've known for a while that Microsoft's been doing some really interesting stuff with from a security perspective in, in the Windows platform. Mm-hmm. Here's some interesting announcements on updates to Defender, integration with their SIM. You know, a lot of people have asked uh, on the advisory, the, like the financial analyst side about, you know, is Microsoft going to be a security vendor or aren't they, right? You're starting to see some interesting moves in this third article, Paul, of them getting a little more advanced with some of the security office uh, offerings coming out of Microsoft. Agreed. And I still can't keep the naming straight because Microsoft 365 Defender replaces Microsoft Threat Protection. Uh, mm-hmm. Included in that Microsoft 365 Defender Suite is an updated version of Microsoft Defender ATP, now known as Microsoft Defender for Endpoint. I, 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 it, it just goes on, right? Defender for Office 365, formerly Office 365 ATP, and Microsoft Defender for Identity, previously known as Azure ATP, will also be part of Microsoft 365 Defender Suite. But I like my head yep. spinning. <laughs> it's just the name. Yeah. It, it sounds it, like they're just, trying to so, uh, like agree on a name. So, right. the, yeah, so making the, it simpler, right? They're branding everything around Defender, both on mm-hmm. the Microsoft side, but also Azure. So there's the right. second package, Azure Defender, is gonna uh, uh, is described as the evolution of Azure Security Center, mm-hmm. right? So a lot of security vendors 
have made integrations into Azure Security Center, they're going to rename that with the Defender brand as well. So they're right. trying to centralize all of their security stuff under the Defender, Defender brand. Right, which makes sense and hopefully makes it uh, a lot easier to decipher and figure out what we're talking about when we talk about Microsoft so. security <laughs> products, right? And there were a lot of other announcements that came out of Ignite. Um, so make sure you check those out because uh, Microsoft's been making some uh, obviously good improvements uh, to the security. So, um, Matt, I know you did uh, a briefing with Code42. Um, wh when they say they have a cloud native product, their solution lives in the cloud. Because we were talking about that right. earlier, if they help protect data in the cloud, being a backup company, they're on the insider threat thing, but they're more on the endpoint not as a cloud solution for you, their solution is in the cloud, I think is what they meant. Correct. Yeah. So, you know, most people know Code 42 for the, the backup and recovery product, agent on the box, backing up files in the cloud so you can manage them and restore them from the cloud. Okay. So that's how they started. Mm -hmm. But years ago, they started to evolve with this agent footprint to realize that they could provide more endpoint capabilities. And we've got another big announcement on the endpoint uh, in this stack of news today, too, where they've expanded to look at other insider threat and capabilities. Also, that agent's communicating back to the cloud. So they have a more of a cl cloud native mm -hmm. solution, but it's very endpoint specific with their endpoint agent. Gotcha. Uh, and Qualys, of course, uh, it was the other announcement you were referring to. Yes, the the Qualys Multi Vector EDR. I mean, <laughs> this is just so having worked for Philippe for almost three years uh, and watching the early days of Qualys and kind of where they drew the line. Yeah, that line has been shattered. It's gone. I, I mean, anybody who who understood kind of the philosophy back in the early days of Qualys, crossing over to the response side of the house was just not in the cards back then. Mm -hmm. But they've made a ton of improvements over the last year. I think this is one of the acquisitions they did earlier this year is what's enabled this new EDR functionality. And so what you have is you have this uh, Qualys' endpoint agent that was used primarily for vulnerability detection, configuration management as part of policy compliance, yep. maybe some application stuff, just continuing to get expanded and providing patching. Now they're providing endpoint detection response capabilities. I mean, th these are just some major announcements of capabilities where they can now centralize so much stuff into the Qualys uh, platform. You know, it, it's interesting, Matt, uh, we've covered Microsoft and now Qualys. Um, I think Qualys is well poised as a security vendor to compete with Microsoft on that front, right? I mean, Microsoft doesn't necessarily have a vulnerability scanner, right? I mean, they've got you know, of course, the they patching. Use Qualys. Native, right. I think they still use Qualys under the covers for a, a lot of their internal stuff. But yeah. essentially what Qualys is now building and has built is a lot of the capabilities that Microsoft would have natively to be able to compete on all those fronts, right? Now you're adding EDR into the mix. I can do patching. I can do vulnerability scanning. Um, what else can I do? I can do a lot of things with the Qualys <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. agent deployment in their solution today. So. Yeah, I like how, I think it was the IDC quote in here that positioned it said, Qualys is entering the EDR space with an attractive offering, one particularly for companies that place a high priority on vulnerability management. Mm -hmm. Because if you're, if you're doing vul management and you've already got the Qualys agent loaded, this is, this is easy, right? Yes. It's literally turning on a switch in the back office of, of Qualys' platform, mm -hmm. and boom, now you have EDR. You don't even have to worry about deploying agents anymore. It's, it is a really interesting announcement. It puts them into a lot of adjacency markets that they stayed away from for a while. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is where I wanted to take Tenable in some respects. This is where Rapid7's right. gone in some respects. Yep. Now you see Qualys just all in in some of these adjacencies. Uh, uh, you know, also having uh, spoken with Sumed and Philippe, right, I think they have done a fantastic job of balancing that partnership versus acquisition versus build it ourselves. And they've just made the right decisions, I think, uh, every single time. Yeah, I mean, I think he's been really frugal about it. Mm -hmm. When you think about it, he's bought, he's he's made very strategic acquisitions to bring in a, a very interesting pieces of innovation yep. to allow the platform to move ahead. Mm -hmm. without spending, overspending for an acquisition, right. for example, which right. I think other security vendors have done. Right. Uh, they've overpaid 
to get certain capabilities. Rapid I don't 7's think also Wallace... done, but Rapid 7's also done a great job of managing yes. their acquisitions very well. That's true too. Um, I think the command acquisition and some mm -hmm. of those other things that they did at the time they did them were were very strategic and they didn't have to overpay. Versus somebody like a Palo Alto who yeah. they've got the cash, so sometimes they overspend. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, where else do you want to go? Uh, let's see. There was uh, a couple other interesting articles here. We definitely want to talk about Palantir before we get off of this. Um, uh, in the Jupiter One mm -hmm. raise for sure. I wanted to talk Docker Enterprise Container Cloud uh, and get your thoughts on this one if you've looked at it yet. Because so Docker Enterprise gets sold to, to Mirantis. Mm -hmm. They now have this announcement of, for I guess, if you're a Docker Enterprise customer, you can use this cloud for free to host some of your containers. Mm -hmm. I was like, hmm. I wonder what that looks like versus what we're doing in AWS. Is right. this an attractive offering for people that are running containerized applications? Right. It, it, well, you know what's interesting too, Matt, um, is not only have we put our application inside of containers, but now we're putting our CSE pipeline also in containers. <laughs> and so you may end up with more containers for your app, but you're going to end up with more containers for your pipeline as well. <laughs> Uh, you know, it, or you can go with a SaaS provider, right? I mean, there's advantages and disadvantages, I think, to both. Uh, do you put those, I would put them in the same Kubernetes cluster, right? And then find a good home for your Kubernetes cluster because I can manage the permissions between the pipeline containers and the production containers. I would think all within the same Kubernetes cluster, right? It may be, but this is what's interesting about this announcement. Docker Enterprise Container Cloud is available for free of charge for up to three clusters, totaling 15 nodes. Wow, that's pretty, that's pretty yeah, sweet. Yeah, so now I can have, so, so I got one cluster for my CICD pipeline, yep. one for staging, and one for production. There's right, your three right. clusters. Yep. As long as you don't surpass 15 nodes, that might be a really interesting, attractive offering compared mm -hmm. to rolling your own under AWS, I'm just saying. Right. Or a lot of people rolling their own on-prem because mm -hmm. they get the bill. <laughs> but that's, I mean, that's Docker's, I think, play here, right? It's get them on their platform, get the uh, customers Correct. on the platform, right? Yeah, get them off of Community Edition to Enterprise Edition, mm -hmm. right? And then keep them there. And right. this is kind of the play that it looks like Marantis is trying to do with the Docker Enterprise customers. Well, that's a great, it's a great play for sure. Um, let's talk a little bit about funding, uh, and, uh, IPO. So, uh, Palantir's IPO, is that? Yeah, so it's interesting. The way this is positioned is it's a direct listing without a cash raise. So is it really an IPO? Mm. Okay. Cause mm. most IPOs, when you put your, when you put your stock out there, you're trying to clear, you know, a hundred, 200 million to invest. So the way this article positions, so I, did, I was doing a little research because I'm trying to think, like, how do you do this, right? It looks like they're just going to start listing their stock on the New York Stock Exchange uh, for 0 0.0001, which is basically par value, on September 30th. Buy it and then see where the stock price goes. It, it's kind of an hmm. interesting approach. But they're only giving up, I think, something like 3.4% of the voting shares in these Class A shares. The company, the, the original founders and the employees still have a, a ton of control. Where in an IPO, you might give up more control to raise mm -hmm. that cash. It's a very interesting variation of an IPO. Um, something we'll watch. You know, Palantir is not a pure play security company. Yeah. They, they have... A lot of data analytics capabilities. Cybersecurity is one of those one of kind them, of right. tiers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so it's, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out because it's a it's a unique approach to coming into uh, the public markets. Uh, Accenture acquires Salt Solutions to build cloud based industrial IoT platforms. Now, this yeah. is not Salt Security and it's not Salt Stack, right? Salt Security, <laughs> API Security. Uh, yes. Salt Stack Configuration Management, uh, Salt Solutions, a technology consultancy headquartered in Germany, um, and implements and maintains IT systems for production operations, automotive and manufacturing. So an industrial uh, play, which is a big industry uh, in Germany, right? Because Siemens 
Mm-hmm. Siemens is based in Germany, right? Yeah. Siemens yeah. is based in Germany, but you also have uh, Mercedes and, and BMW and yep. Volkswagen. A lot of manufacturing. Yep. A lot so of manufacturing, yep. a lot of auto manufacturing yep. there. I mean, you've got three major uh, car manufacturers mm-hmm. there. I th- well, yeah, I think Porsche is part At of Volkswagen. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, there's been a lot of consolidation in that industry, certainly. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Jupiter, yeah, I just wanted to make the dis- oh, distinction yeah, that yeah. uh, the, the different salt so people didn't get confused. Uh, yeah. yeah, because so, y- go ahead. there are a lot of salt companies salt out there. Salt companies, so. right. <laughs> uh, so Jupiter One. What is Jupiter One? What do they do? Yeah, so I actually had an opportunity to talk to one of our good friends, mm-hmm. Tyler Shields, uh, earlier this week. He went, he's the new chief marketing officer at Jupiter One. So I really wanted to understand, hey, wh- Who's this company? What are they doing? Because I, I had a feeling we'd probably talk about them. Uh, it's interesting. They're, they're going after the asset management space initially mm-hmm. with, I think, a lot of use cases to come. But if you think about one of the big challenges in the industry still is this concept of where are all my assets and what's the interrelationship of those assets? So they've taken a pretty interesting approach where they've created initial functionality that allows you to go out and discover and identify your assets, both on-prem and in the cloud. So they have API integrations into the different cloud platforms to be able to pull in your assets. But then they model them in a graph database so they understand the relationship between all these assets. Now, if you remember my background in the GRC space, this is Mm -hmm. what Control Path did in the early days, right? right? We pulled in assets, understood the relationship, then we started to go out and assess risk against control gaps uh, from a compliance perspective. That same base graph structure has a lot of potential uses in the industry. And I think this is where Jupiter One ultimately wants to go, which is what are all the different use cases I can apply now that I have a really good understanding of the assets? It could go down a security path, a compliance path, a mm-hmm. risk path, and variations of that. So they've announced some initial asset discovery, visibility, and compliance capabilities. I think this platform gets a lot bigger longer term. Um. Let's see. Uh, acquisition checkpoint buys Odo Security, uh, which is a cloud-based uh, security company focusing on remote access, uh, which is interesting. Uh, I'm just going to wrap up a couple stories, Matt. Um, the other one was uh, Logarithm and Attack IQ announced uh, an integration, um, which I mean that just makes sense, right? Obviously, you want the telemetry from your Baz going into your SIM to to play. If you're playing acronym bingo at home. Uh, pay attention because there's a couple in that last sentence. Uh, also, Core Security has announced uh, the availability of enterprise grade identity governance software for small and mid sized organizations. Uh, I mean, no, not being shy about going after the mid market um, or at least small to mid sized organizations, which mid market, nec- uh, it could be an overloaded term, right? Because yes. small enterprise is, is in there bef- before enterprise. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Uh, the one I wanted to get your take on, CloudBees enhances its CI/CD solutions to help customers reduce risk. Have you heard of CloudBees before? Yeah, I think they're the commercial version of Puppet or Chef. I can't remember which ah, one. It might okay. be Puppet. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the CloudBees is an enterprise version of these uh, different open source orchestration tools. And so mm-hmm. what they're doing is providing commercial capability. So think of them more like a GitLab. A competitor where mm-hmm. they're building out aspects of the CI/CD pipeline right. under kind of more of a commercial uh, pay paid model versus just using the open source products that are out there and rolling your own. So, you know, is it something we would look at? Maybe, mm. um, but it's probably more for larger organizations that are looking for more support and more enterprise features out of some of these different CI/CD pipeline tools. Gotcha. Outstanding. That will wrap up the news for this week. Stay tuned. Some awesome interviews coming up next. 